This may be familiar to several of you, but I would like to start with a brief introduction to Norfund and highlights of our approach to understanding and measuring the difference that we make. This year we celebrate Norfund's 25th anniversary. Norfund was set up to assist in building sustainable businesses and industries in developing countries by providing equity capital and other risk capital and to invest in businesses that would not otherwise be funded because of the high levels of risk involved. This is our mandate as stated in the Norfund Act. We have defined a mission to create jobs and improve lives by investing in businesses that drive sustainable development. To deliver on this, we have chosen four investment areas that we see as essential drivers for sustainable development and through which we make clear contributions to the sustainable development goals. These are clean energy, financial institutions, green infrastructure and scalable enterprises. But how can we know if we deliver on our mandate and our mission that we in fact do contribute to sustainable development? One thing is for sure, we do not just sit around and wait for a miracle to occur. We want to understand both the development effects from our investees and whether our engagement has helped unleash these effects. Let's take an example to illustrate. In 2015, Norfan invested in Centro Solar de Mucuba, the first large-scale solar power plant in Mozambique. Norfan provided capital, both early-stage project development financing and equity and guarantees. We collaborated with the embassy and we invested together with KLP and Scartec. And as this was the first renewable independent power producer, new laws and regulations had to be drafted. We also helped secure environmental and social standards and compliance with Mozambican law and the IFC performance standards. And we funded ENS initiatives through Norfund's business support facility. The project has contributed significantly to local jobs. More than a thousand local workers were hired during the construction phase of the power plant. But most importantly, the Makuba power plant has contributed to an increase in renewable energy supply and stability in supply. The solar power plant has a capacity of 40 megawatt and an annual power production of 79 gigawatt hours per year. This is enough to serve 170,000 households. It has also helped reduce energy transmission losses and improve the security of energy supply in the northern Mozambique. Macroeconomic studies show that the project likely also has long-term job effects by providing a better and more reliable energy supply for local businesses that can in turn hire more people. More generally, when we try to understand what our effect on development is, we use what is called a theory of change. This helps us understand how our inputs, such as providing capital to fund a solar power project, leads to certain outputs and outcomes, such as power generation and reduced power uh, outage, as well as broader effects on the economy. In practical terms, we try to understand and document the development effects across our portfolio by using different building blocks. We continue to strive to refine our approach but we also want to balance the need for sufficient insights with the reporting burden on our investees. We look to research and macroeconomic studies as these form, as these form the foundation of our theories. This could be examining the link between energy supply and stability and economic growth. In more detail, we work to measure the essential parts of development effects from our investees. Each year we collect development effects data from all our investees, and as Telef said, that's more than a thousand companies. And last year we had a response rate of 98%. This covers both portfolio-wide indicators like jobs and taxes, and sector-specific indicators like power generation. We also use the joint impact model to estimate certain effects that we cannot measure directly. This could be indirect jobs. And for a power plant like Mocuba, that would be the employees in the businesses that use the electricity generated by the power plant. We also use case studies to better understand and document other more qualitative aspects. We dive into specific investments like Mocuba 
to go more in depth with the challenges and solutions that we'd met. For example, the impact on local communities. And by using these building blocks together, we get a pretty good idea of how our investees contribute to development. But we also need to understand whether we are additional, whether our development effects would not have happened without us, without our inputs. How do we know that the Mercuba power plant wouldn't have been built hadn't we provided the capital? That the increase in renewable energy supply wouldn't have been realized without our support? Being additional is a precondition for our engagement. It's part of our mandate. In practice, this means that we shall make a financial or a non-financial contribution that would not otherwise have been provided. But we will never know for certain what would have happened had North Fund not invested. We will never have a full proof of our additionality. Instead, we try to understand how likely it is that development effects happen as a consequence of our engagement and that they would not have happened without us. In North Fund, we use a framework to assess our additionality for each individual investment. We also have a set of KPIs that we use at portfolio level. And together, these help us invest where capital is scarce and where we can add value through influence and expertise. So even though we can never know for sure what would have happened otherwise, we do not rely on a miracle either. And with this as a context, I would now like to turn to our three panelists to discuss how do we know if we make a difference. <laughs> Please welcome attending by link, I hope. Yes, thank you. Abdi Karim yes. Gole. <laughs> uh, Abdi Karim is a deputy director of Shiraco that manages the Nordic Horn of Africa Opportunities Fund in which Norfund has invested. Please also welcome on stage Paddy Carter, Director of Development Impact Research and Policy at British International Investments, or BII, our sister organization in the UK. And finally, also welcome to you, Hovart Nygo, Director of Department for Knowledge at NORAD, the Norwegian Aid Agency. Abdi Karim, I would like to start with you. Could you please briefly share with us what are the types of dilemmas and considerations that you face on the ground working in Somalia and in Somaliland? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, there are actually many uh, challenges facing uh, investors in Somalia, Somaliland, but the main challenges are uh, informal economy and limited uh, data in the country. So an, as an investor, we require uh, a lot of documents from the business, but due to informality of the business, actually they cannot and comply and they cannot then or it will be difficult to them to comply and to submit these documentations other uh, challenges we're facing is a lack of uh, or shortage of skilled workforce uh, weak government institutions and legal systems and also there's no enough uh, financial institutions both commercial level and investment banks and even insurance so access to finance to businesses uh, especially smes is a challenge and uh, there's no enough uh, or, or right capital uh, and with the right terms uh, for the local SMEs. The uh, other challenge actually we face as investors to wire investment funds from Somalia is a challenge. And this actually all the new investors, they ask always, if you want to recoup our investment, how we can get it out from Somalia. Other, other challenges are like international trade uh, barriers, uh, like uh, in challenges related with high cost of shipment to Somalia, lack of letter of credits for the businesses, and even some ins insurance actually they don't even cover if your shipment goes to Somalia. So actually, generally, doing business in, in Somalia actually is a challenge because of the fragility and post-conflict situation we, they are in, in, in the country. Yeah. Thank you so much. I would also like to understand, so in Northland, we tried to document the development effects and whether we actually make a difference. Could you please share with us how do you try to document the effects of your engagements on the ground? Actually, as uh, the only impact in our fund that's actually active in the country, and uh, we, we have uh, processes, pre-funding and post-funding. For the pre-funding, uh, uh, Shurak flows uh, through investment selection process. 
including a client identification uh, and screening and a comprehensive due diligence process like checking the ESG ex exclusion list, deal structuring and, and funding. And both funding actually we follow Shurak actively manages and monitors each uh, investment through collection of reports, mm. side visits uh, from both from the investors and from our staff, also creating client relationship uh, uh, to support them. And since the economy is informal, so also we collect uh, data through progress reports, which we collect every six months. And in these reports, we uh, capture total jobs created, and for both women, uh, men, and women and youth, and also women-owned businesses, how many in business, women-owned business that we, we helped, also youth-owned business, also first-time borrowers, some of our clients actually is the first time they get lending or, or finance, also the financial growth of the business after they get investment, also we, we get that data. Also we check um, any EST-related data that, you know, for some, if there's an incident happen, and, and also changes of the business practices, uh, if it's six months, we collect this data. So in that sense, we, we that's how we measure the impact that investment is making. Thank you. I know that we also put quite a reporting burden on you. You have several DFIs as investors. Could you please share with us, how do we actually strike the right balance between documentation and reasonable reporting burden coming from the receiving end? Yeah, one of the challenges actually we're facing is uh, and you know we we requesting from our clients uh, a level that they are not you know more developed countries level. So for example, the ESG requests from the DFIs in general is not realistic because this is actually something foreign to them. They never heard about the ESG requirements. So our clients always they ask if they pay the loan on time. Why are we asking them all these reports, including ESG report and also doing side visits? Since the other uh, financial institution is a local bank, they don't do that. They give the loan and then they just pay the loan. So it's actually for them, it's a cultural change. So, and it needs patience from the DFIs uh, and, and time. Also the documentation we are asking uh, is not realistic because we are asking documents we not, will not uh, uh, collect from advanced markets in developing countries. And these businesses are informal uh, and they operate a fragile setting. So they always question why we're asking all these documentation since other financial institutions they are not asking. So it's actually also, you need some patience uh, to end. Uh, and to wait the, the, the market actually to grow and so uh, step by step it requests these requirements. So to formalize the business and, and comply the process, the Nordic funds has TA funding. So we have a component TA funding funded by the uh, and, and Danish, which can be used for health and safety and financial management systems, staff training, etc. So the clinical assistant will also help the you know the, the small and uh, SMEs and and the impact that the COVID also made during the last two years. So in this sense, actually, this will, but this will take time because it needs cultural change. So we need to be a little bit patient, uh, especially for the DFI side, you know, to comply all the ESG requirements because it will, it will take time, you know, to, you know, to, uh, to teach them. So through the technical assistance facility that actually we help in the health and safety. And some of them, they don't have fire institutions, they don't have fire exits. So all, you know, we help them to, through the technical assistance too the importance of health and safety of the staff and, and, and also to build them their financial systems. So that needs to be patient. So in, so from the DFI side, we request, you know, to, to be patient with the, you know, the fragile, you know, settings and give them time to learn uh, the, uh, in the, and formalize the businesses. Yes, thank you so much. We'll take that with us. I'll get back to you in just a bit. I would now like to turn to you, Hovat, and understand if you could Please share with us just briefly about what are the types and dilemmas of dilemmas and considerations that you face in your work as an evaluation expert. Thank you, Singda. Um, so that's a good question, right? So, so um, I come at this from a slightly different angle, right? So NORAD works through our partners to get results uh, on the ground, and I'm my role or our job is to try to get a handle of on what we achieve. Right across all of this, and across all of the partners, and acro across all of their projects, etc., etc. So at more of a systems level. And I think the primary dilemma for me is that. Okay, so uh, probably the most useful thing uh, a statistics or econom econometrics class ever taught me is that it's better to be roughly right than exactly wrong. Uh, the problem is that results reporting 
uh, maybe I'm being controversial here, but the problem is that a lot of results reporting today is geared towards compliance, right? So it's geared towards measuring a specific thing uh, that the partner can, you know, with two lines on the answer, can say this is something that we delivered. The problem there is that that very often gives us an exactly wrong answer in the sense that it was right, but it probably wasn't the most useful thing in understanding the broader impact uh, in what we're doing. So I think, you know, from, from my perspective, getting out of that corner that we've, to some extent, painted ourselves a little into, to be able to think of results not as a compliance mechanism, although obviously a compliance has to be part of it, but not primarily as a compliance mechanism, but as, uh, and, and definitely not as something that we just archive, which is what happens with a lot of nice results today, but as the, as the starting point of, uh, of analysis, right? Uh, so that you can you can uh, you can un understand results at an analytical level and then use uh, use uh, appropriate levels of statistics and uncertainty blah 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 etc cetera, etc cetera, to to get a good sound statistical understanding of what you are uh, achieving and that will never be a two lines under the answer kind of thing but it will be much much more useful than than a you know tiny little thing in the corner that no one really cares about. Yes, thank you. That also goes a bit back to the additionality mm. that I said. We had to be additional, but we can never know for 100%. We can never be 100% certain that we actually are additional. No. I, so um, I, I think that that's core, right? So, so a, a, a additionality is, is basically it's just um, uh, the counterfactual. Uh, and the, uh, a, a result is only really truly useful from an impact perspective when we can think of it as a counterfactual. You know, did, what would we have achieved if it wasn't for that? You, you've come a long way and you're much more sophisticated in how you think about additionality in, in, in Norfan and in private sector mobilization, but that broader counterfactual thinking is something that still is, you know, not as well developed, tending towards sorely lacking in terms of broader development impact measurement at the systems level, right? So I think uh, at, at a, at on the ground, a lot of the partners are really good at thinking through all of this, but when it you know, reaches all the way up to us, something gets lost. Yes, thank you. And Patty, you've been working with additionality for quite a long time. Could you share with us, if we don't know for certain, what would you say, what should we do? Thank you, yeah. I, I want to start just by saying how pleased I am to be here. Um, Norfund, I think I can say, is probably BII's most important partner, and, and that's because you, you share our willingness to take risk and to be more entrepreneurial and to really make things happen, so uh, long may that continue. So yes, I was watching some top-flight academic economists the other day give a presentation to impact investors, and their message was pretty much, if you can't do a rigorous evaluation, better do nothing at all. Naive before and after comparisons can be uh, completely misleading. And what they mean by a rigorous evaluation is exactly that. You have to do something to put yourself in a position to estimate the counterfactual of what would have happened had you not done the thing that you did. Now, the problem for us is we can't really obtain that sort of evidence. We cannot randomly allocate development finance to 50 countries and withhold it from another 50 countries. We cannot invest at random. You will not find the answer by comparing uh, businesses that received DF DFI investments uh, against businesses that did not receive DFI investments, because the whole point is some businesses don't need us. So um, that puts us in a very uncomfortable situation. Uh, every now and then, uh, somebody commissions an evaluation of DFIs, and then the report comes back and it says, we can find no evidence that DFIs are, are additional. Um, so we need other forms of evidence. Now, I know that we've, we've just heard about the importance of statistical evidence, but let's not forget anecdotal evidence. Personally, when I speak to a someone who's been investing around the world for 30 years, and they tell me there is no way on earth that a commercial investor would have invested in that project that you nutters have just done. Uh, I find that quite compelling. And the, 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 kind of the, the evidence lies in the arguments behind that statement. So as we've just heard, you know, additionality is not something you can observe. It is something that you can have reasons to believe 
is more or less likely. And that means that the evidence, the arguments are probably out there in the heads of lots of people in this room, and we need to get better at getting it out of your heads and into the public domain. And we need evaluators that are better at asking the right questions, interpreting what they hear correctly, and we need people to take that sort of evidence seriously. And this is very difficult, because firms aren't going to want to say, certainly not in public, oh yeah, you don't want to invest in us, you know, we're, a, you know, we're not a great proposition. It's not easy for people to talk about uh, this stuff, frankly, but we have to do um, what we can. Um, I want to make just one last quick point on additionality, if I may, and that is when these evaluations come back, they ought to find that some of our investments are not additional, which sounds crazy, but uh, I want to explain why. If we set the bar too high on additionality, we would be turning away too many investments that would have been additional. We face risks on both sides of, uh, of doing things that are not additional and failing to do things that would have been additional. I'm absolutely not saying that we have to be complacent about additionality. One of my main, most important jobs maybe inside uh, BII is talking to new staff, and my main message is that additionality is the mission. And we have to ask ourselves the tough questions about additionality. Mm -hmm. However, we have to recognize that if we're getting things right, we're, we're having to balance this risk on two sides, which means we're going to sometimes get it wrong. Yes, no, thank you so much. Completely agree. <laughs> um, but when we evaluate our development effects, but also the additionality, that requires a lot of information and information gathering. And we mm. can just spend enormous effort on that. How should we prioritize our efforts and our focus? What should we? Mm what to drive us in the right direction, and how do we make sure that we actually then use the results mm. in the best way? Uh, again, excellent question. So um, uh, I think a, a challenge now right, is that a lot of, a lot of the evaluation work is um, um, autopilot, right? So uh, you know, you know at, at some point in the program cycle, you have to do a, a midterm review. Uh, so when you get halfway th through it, you, you, s you start a midterm review, and you get something sometimes out of that review. Very often you don't get much, honestly, out of that review. I think a, what we need to do instead, right, is um, so if, if we are not thinking through, planning for investing in uh, the learning process, the knowledge gathering and the measurement in the design phase, of a, of a project or a program at whatever level, you know, if, if it's uh, the concrete project on the ground, all the large portfolios that we are, we are handling, then, uh, then almost whatever you do when you get to the evaluation phase won't be useful, right? If you're not set up from the get-go to uh, collect the kind of data, whatever that data is, uh, to, 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 to uh, you know, the kind of data that you need to actually give you information about whether you're hitting the targets that you need to hit and not whatever it was possible for a consultancy to measure when they got the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, evaluation grant at midterm through something that was already ongoing, then I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll never get to a point where we are really uh, uh, learning much through the evaluation phase uh, and, and definitely not getting to a phase where we can say something very meaningful at the aggregate level on, you know, on impact. What are we achieving and what aren't we achieving? So it has to be part of the design phase and it has to get as much attention as all of the other stuff that gets a lot of attention in the design phase. Mm. Yes, thank you. If we put it a bit simply, Paddy, I would like to ask you, so if we say that uh, investing in a power plant, that helps increase the energy supply. Uh, if we invest in agribusiness, that helps increase the food supply. But how can we know what makes the most impact? Can we in any way compare, there, compare the two and have a priority on where we should put our money? Yeah, so uh, academics who um, study foreign aid sometimes talk about something called the micro-macro paradox. And they coin that phrase because it seems to be quite easy to find evidence of positive impacts of individual projects, but quite hard to find evidence that it adds up to something in the, in the aggregate. Now, we have the opposite problem. We have a macro-micro a paradox. It's really not hard to understand the importance of a sustained investment boom in the amazing reduction in extreme poverty in China over the last couple of decades. It would be very hard to say, how much did that factory contribute to uh, reducing poverty? And that's often the kind of question that we are being asked. And um, you know, you've mentioned one of the things we can do is that we can uh, look at um, not our own evaluations, 
but the broader academic evidence. So normally getting evidence requires you to be, have lots of observations, lots of variation over time and place, and then you can start to learn something about uh, causal effects. You can't really do that by looking at one cement plant. Um, but there's a lot of high quality uh, empirical evidence out there that we can draw on. But I'm gonna make a bit of a controversial point maybe, which is that the next frontier, it's, it's not so much about impact measurement, it's, it's impact valuation. We aren't going to. We are normally not designing projects, so we don't want to. We don't want evidence to learn about how to iterate the next design of a project. Normally, we delegate that to the management team that is reacting to what they see happening in the market. And our problem is, what should we be trying to do more or less of? It's about our portfolio construction, mm. and it's about our um, uh, yeah origination efforts. Mm. And until we have a clear idea of what we what what we regard as more or less impact. We can, we can make these sort of relative judgments. We, we just get like this uninterpretable bundle of d different types of impact evidence all over the place, and it doesn't really help us um, prioritize our activities. So I'm, I would say that the next frontier is, is not necessarily just uh, uh, getting the, like, the um, evidence, it's interpreting it and, and working out what we, what we want to do as a result of it. Yes. Do you have any comments on that, Hobart? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I think th that's an, a, a crucial point, right? I think, yeah. uh, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's exactly what, what Patty was thinking, but, but, uh, but uh, this made me think of you know, um, costing and, and benchmarking, which is, uh, to me, something that we should uh, be much better at in, in, in Norwegian development assistance. It is, you know, it's very easy to find a a, it's very easy to find an example of an initiative that you know, some randomized control trial or whatever says has an effect. It's much harder to do the prioritization and say that, yeah, all of this stuff has effect, but these things over here, they have really large effects, transformative effects. So maybe we should stop doing all of this, which a lot of people might find popular, uh, and instead put our money uh, where we think the effects will be even larger. Uh, that's not something we have a tradition of doing, but it, I think that's a framework within we could uh, basically achieve much more uh, with Norwegian development assistance. Thank you so much to both of you. I would like to turn to uh, Abdi Karim again. Uh, would you have any reflections on this? Being there working on the ground, what is your uh, considerations about this? Um, for um, mainly and um, for actually, I will I will some advice I will give to an uh, an DFIs um, is actually to to consider the local context and what's uh, each context different than the others, and when you're measuring impact, uh, there's many ways you can measure and so that's actually one advice I give. For example, mm. like North Fund and one. They uh, came to Argesa in 2016. Actually, actually, they, they take a risk. But actually, that risk actually paid off now. Mm. And as a pioneer of the and, and the first DFI invested in the Nordic Fund of Opportunity, and it played a catalytic role in attracting more funds to the Nordic Fund. And because of uh, North Fund investment, other investors joined, like IFU, EDA, and, and EU. And currently, we are negotiating with the Squid Fund. So I think that the perceived risk actually if you manage. Actually, you can make an impact. So real North Fund is making a difference because their investment supports local businesses to grow and create sustainable jobs and gradually for business formalization, uh, like ESG and others, and continue impact in the long term. So actually, I will advise uh, North Fund other investors at DFIs. Since, for example, North Fund has tested the Somali market and making differences. So actually now, North Fund has a platform to build on complete large scale investment and as a result, make more impact and change lives, like security and, and energy sector. So, and also support building system that increases the investment yeah. in the country, considering local context and has a long-term plan um, and build informality of business and business culture. For example, to train and teach business the HD processes, proper financial reporting, and to give time to business to adapt and learn, and learn this new business. But actually, the impact you can see on the North Fund and actually a team visit and they can be like vegan and actually see you know the change that the business is taking 
and for food security, uh, like greenhouses for um, and farming, solar uh, for irrigation, and actually also for drinking water. Both. So you can see, you know, that you know the impact actually this investments are making. Actually, nobody else going there <laughs> because of the civil risk. But if you actually study the risk, you can monitor and you can manage, and also you can make impact at the same time. Yes, thank you so much. With this, I would like to thank our three panelists for an interesting discussion, and we'll definitely take all your inputs with us. Thank you so much, all three of you. Thank you.